modern Christianities. Let's see how much you remember about the Protestant Reformation. Who was Martin Luther, and what did he argue for? Define indulgence, purgatory, justification, the three solas, Protestant Reformation, and denomination. What are the many effects of the Reformation on different groups of people? Part 1. Aggiornamento. Catholicism today. In the wake of the Protestant Reformation, Catholicism too transformed. Although most Catholics didn't become Protestants, many Catholics asked the same questions of the Church that the Protestants did. What was the role of the institutional Church, especially the Pope? What was the role of faith, good works, and human free will? What should the Catholic make of those Catholic beliefs and practices, like the confession of sins, or priestly celibacy, or the power of saints, that were at once so important, but were not directly spelled out by the Bible? The Catholic Church's response to all these concerns is referred to as the Catholic Reformation, or the Counter-Reformation. Just because most Catholics didn't leave their ancestral church, that doesn't mean that they thought that the reformers weren't asking important questions. Keeping the ancient custom of resolving inter-Christian debates through councils, the Catholic Church held a number of new councils to discuss the questions of the Reformation and the modern world that the Protestants helped create. The first of these was the Council of Trent. The council discussed many issues, but all of them revolved around the question of dogma, truths that a Catholic must accept in order to still be considered a Catholic Christian. At Trent, the general consensus of the bishops was that Christianity was not governed by the Bible alone, as most Protestants would have argued, but that tradition was also authoritative. If Christians had a long history of interpreting their religion in a certain way, there was truth and value to that, even if that interpretation wasn't grounded in the biblical texts. Remember that since ancient times, the Catholic Church had argued that the bishops and priests were the descendants of the apostles of Jesus himself. And as those apostles received their teachings by God, the Holy Spirit, at Pentecost, God's will could be gifted to people even after the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, God revealed texts like the Bible, and those are true, but God also spoke and still speaks to the Church. The dogmas of the Church, and especially the findings of the Church councils, they all spoke with the same truth as the Bible. Both the Bible and the Church received truths revealed by God. So, the Council of Trent concluded that Luther was wrong. It wasn't scripture alone, but scripture and tradition. And likewise, they concluded that Luther was incorrect about faith. Faith was critical, but it wasn't faith alone, but faith and good works had to go together. Yes, humans are by definition broken and stuck in sin, but both the right thoughts, your faith, and acts of mercy, piety, and generosity together can overcome sin. Your actions can even help your faith. Prayers and rituals and charity could make your faith stronger, deeper, just as having the right faith could make your deeds more righteous. And Luther was also wrong about grace alone, too. Trent concluded that yes, we are saved by the grace of God, but we're still full human beings with free will and choice. No one was predestined for anything. God offers Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to the people, and people are free to accept or reject the offer. 
Another Catholic dogma that became more central following the Reformation was the affirmation of the Pope as the descendant of Peter and the steward of Christ on earth. It was very clear to all that many of the popes had been less than righteous individuals, and that many had even used their office for selfish and violent ends. But Catholics said those were incidental events. They came from the sinfulness of certain individuals, and they said nothing about the truth of the papacy itself as an institution. At a later meeting, called the First Vatican Council, the Church argued for papal infallibility. This is a notoriously misunderstood dogma of the Catholic Church. It does not mean that a pope cannot make a mistake or sin. Instead, it means that the office of the papacy itself cannot make a mistake. A certain pope can be wrong, but the papacy cannot be. And the papacy only acts in very certain situations, say at a church council. So, if a given pope is just having a conversation with someone, he can sin and make errors just like anyone else. But when that same pope speaks on behalf of the dogmas and ethics of Christianity itself, he's channeling the will of the Holy Spirit through the biblical message and the traditions of the church. At a second Vatican Council, the bishops asked themselves how the church responded to the modern world. There's a famous story of Pope John XXIII, who convened the council. Someone asked him why it was called, and he simply walked over to the window and opened it. The Second Vatican Council, this gesture explained, was a way to let the fresh air in and get some sunshine into the church, which was often criticized for being defiantly medieval. The word Pope John XXIII used, which would become something of the theme of the council, was that this was an aggiornamento, a bringing up to date of the church. First, the council concluded that the church needed to make itself more approachable to all Catholics, especially the laity. For the first time at a church council, the members of the laity were invited to offer their thoughts on certain matters. Masses should be performed in local languages, not in the Latin of the Middle Ages. Everyone should understand the words of the religious services. And practices that drew strong boundaries between the institutional church, the clergy, and the Catholic laity, well, those should be loosened. For a famous example, since ancient times, priests would perform their services with their backs to the people, addressing their words forward to God. Now, after Vatican II, priests turned around they faced the people they served. The Mass was supposed to be a discussion of a community together. The priest and the laity had to address each other. Not only did the Council conclude that the clergy needed to reach out to the Catholic laity, it rather radically concluded that it needed to reach out to non-Christians. This is called ecumenism, literally crossing the whole world. Directly, this means one Christian group or church finding common ground with other Christian groups and churches. So, at Vatican II, the Catholic Church affirmed that it had a shared heritage with Protestant and Orthodox Christians, and that they should work together towards a greater good. But even further, the Council reached out to non-Christians. In the most famous document of the Second Vatican Council, called Nostra Etate, or in our times, the Church declared a shared truth and morality found in non-Christian traditions. From ancient times down to the present, there is found amongst various peoples a certain perception of that hidden power which hovers over the course of things and over the events of human history. At times, some indeed have come to the recognition of a supreme being or even of a father. This perception and recognition penetrates their lives with a profound religious sense. And the document goes on to discuss major world religions one by one. In Hinduism, 
men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an inexhaustible abundance of myths and through searching philosophical inquiry. They seek freedom from the anguish of our human condition, either through ascetical practices, or profound meditation, or a flight to God with love and trust. Again, Buddhism, in its various forms, realizes the radical insufficiency of this changeable world. It teaches a way by which men, in a devout and confident spirit, may be able either to acquire the state of perfect liberation, or attain, by their own efforts, or through higher help, supreme illumination. Likewise, other religions found everywhere try to counter the restlessness of the human heart, each in its own manner, by proposing ways, comprising teachings, rules of life, and sacred rites. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. The Church regards with esteem also the Muslims. They adore the one God, living and subsisting in himself, merciful and all-powerful, the creator of heaven and earth, who has spoken to men. They take pains to submit wholeheartedly to even his inscrutable decrees, just as Abraham, with whom the faith of Islam takes pleasure in linking itself, submitted to God. Though they do not acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. And then finally, a special note is given to the Jews. The church remembers the bond that spiritually ties the people of the new covenant to Abraham's stock. The beginnings of her faith and her election are found already among the patriarchs, Moses, and the prophets. She professes that all who believe in Christ, Abraham's sons according to faith, are included in the same patriarch's call, and likewise that the salvation of the church is mysteriously foreshadowed by the chosen people's exodus from the land of bondage. Notice that nothing in this document of the Second Vatican Council claimed that all religions were equally correct. The Second Vatican Council maintained that there was something uniquely true about Catholic Christianity. But the borders of the truth weren't rigid. If a non-Christian acted or thought in such a way that it expressed the message of Jesus, even if that person had never heard of Jesus, there is truth and goodness to be found there too. Part 2. American Protestantism Christianity is a global phenomena, and it has and continues to manifest itself in all sorts of different ways that we haven't discussed here. But as all of us live in the American cultural sphere, even if we're not Americans ourselves, it's worth asking what forms of Christianity are distinctly intertwined with the United States. It should be noted, too, that from colonial times, there's been something distinctly fragmented about American religion. The 13 original British colonies, which would go on to become the first 13 United States, each had their own unique religious histories, often quite distinct from the other 12. And the states that joined the Union later continued this trend. While the single largest form of Christianity in the United States is Catholicism, the indigenous American Christianities have been Protestant. So let's just focus here on those forms of Protestantism that are native to the United States. The first amongst these was the specifically American version of Anglicanism. Remember that the Anglican Church, the Church of England, is controlled by the British monarch from Henry VIII up to today. And that monarch grants religious authority to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And because this was the official religion of the British Empire, it was therefore the official religion of the British colonies in America. But then the American Revolution happened in 1776, and Americans rejected British rule. And so the question, how can an American revolutionary be an Anglican when you just broke away from the authority of the British crown? Can you still be a member of the Church of England 
when you weren't a British citizen anymore? And so the American Anglican Church reformed so as to reject the authority of the British monarch, but retain the authority of the Anglican bishops, especially the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so they called themselves, using the Greek term, the Church of the Bishops, the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church to this day retains allegiance to the Archbishop of Canterbury and the bishops that he appoints. And like the Anglicans, the Episcopalians retain a very Catholic approach to Christianity in ritual, doctrine, and thought, minus, of course, the papacy, and now the British monarch. And although the founders of the United States were clear that their country had no official religion, Episcopalianism often functioned as a de facto American religion. It was the religion of most of the nation's principal founders, and it conveniently fell in a kind of middle ground between Catholicism and Protestantism, making it somewhat approachable to most American Christians. This is also why, to this day, the National Cathedral of the United States in Washington, D.C., is an Episcopal church, even though hosts of other Christians and non-Christian religious services happen there too. Another British interpretation of Christianity, which reformed drastically in America, is the collective groups of churches that can be called evangelical, literally, ones who preach the gospel, the euangelion in Greek. In 18th century England, a number of reformers moved away from institutional Christianity itself, both Anglican and Catholic. This was moving in the spirit of the Protestant turn to individualism. So these evangelicals would be marked by those interpretations of Christianity which highlighted the individual. First, the individual has to undergo a personal conversion. You couldn't just belong to a church by birth or ethnicity, but rather you had to be born again. You had to make a personal choice to affirm Christianity. Specifically, you had to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. And that could only be done by personally reading and studying the Bible. Now, thinking this way, this approach where Christianity is viewed through the lens of the individual wasn't uncommon for Protestant Christians. In a certain way, it's a very Lutheran approach. But once these thoughts came to the United States, they would couple with the very American tendency to reject structural authorities in all of its forms. In the United States, where much of the country had never lived under any official form of Christianity, the highly personal approach of evangelicalism thrived. Evangelicalism exploded under the American tendency to value personal freedoms, and this also made evangelicalism highly diverse in both practice and thought. Since evangelicals never recognized a single worldwide human Christian authority, and American culture didn't directly enforce one, individual evangelicals could interpret their faith in diametrically opposed ways. So, without a common institutional church, there's a radical freedom in what Christianity is supposed to look like. While all evangelicals would underscore the centrality of personal conversion, the salvation offered through a personal relationship with Jesus, and the primacy of a personal reading of the Bible, how exactly a given evangelical understands conversion, Jesus, and the Bible, that's debatable since there's no outside human authority over all evangelicals who can resolve disagreements. Likewise, evangelical practice is decentralized, so you can see on one side local churches holding small Bible studies several nights a week where students quietly discuss the text together. And then on the other side, you can see megachurches where a single famous preacher will broadcast their message to tens of thousands of people, evoking deep emotional responses as religious ecstasy. This is all evangelicalism. And also, because evangelicalism is decentralized and individualistic, many will even reject the label of evangelical altogether. Growing out of this American evangelical tradition, but spinning off in a very different direction, 
is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, popularly called the Mormons. Their founder, Joseph Smith, was living in upstate New York in the middle of an evangelical revival. Smith claimed that he had been gifted with a number of visitations from an angel named Moroni. This angel also directed Smith to a revealed text written on golden plates in a mysterious language. When translated into English, this would become the Book of Mormon, and it came to be considered scripture along with the Bible. The Book of Mormon told the story of how Jesus had visited the Americas after his resurrection from the dead, and there he gave teachings quite similar to the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. And there was something very desirable about this specifically American version of Christianity that Smith offered, and it won him a band of loyal converts. But others dismissed this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as heretical, cultish, or as an affront to what they personally believed was the true Christianity. The Mormons rejected the Trinity. They introduced a new text as equal to the Bible. And at first, they practiced polygamy, although the Mormon Church officially disbanded that practice in 1890. Because of these beliefs and practices, Smith and his followers were chased from place to place, often by mobs. Such a mob actually killed Smith himself in Illinois. But his followers pressed on, finally basing their movement in what would become Salt Lake City in Utah Territory. Perhaps the most distinctive feature of the Latter-day Saints movement is its insistence on the continuity of prophecy. Even in the New Testament, there is passing reference in the epistles of Paul that Christians still had prophets amongst them. And Mormons considered Joseph Smith to continue in this tradition. He is a prophet. And prophecy never ended, not even with Smith. Prophecy continues through the Latter-day Saint Church, and most especially through its leaders. The president of the Latter-day Saint Church carries the title of prophet. And having a prophet around means that there's an authority who can reinterpret scripture and church teachings as situations require. This continuing revelation serves as both a highly malleable way to maintain Mormon orthodoxy and orthopraxy, and yet allow Mormons to meet the needs of the day. Part 3. Christianity and Modernity Out of the chaos of the wars of religion that followed the Reformation came a distinctly Western notion of modernity. With modernity came a supposedly clear distinction between the secular and the religious, as well as the Western notion of the individual. And to this day, most Westerners understand individualism, religion, and secularism in deep, almost instinctual ways, even if a given Christian doesn't necessarily agree with the separation of religion and secular matters. The separation of religion and secular moved certain forms of thought clearly onto the secular side, which should mean, in theory, that secular matters have nothing to do with a religion like Christianity now was. And likewise, The modern notion of the individual suggests that one ought to be free to think and practice as she likes. Even Christians who believe that all people ought to be Christians in the same way they themselves are, are often deeply uncomfortable with the idea of an outside human authority enforcing Christianity on other individuals. But again, modernity, including individualism and the religious secular break, is a child of the Protestant Reformation. It's a cultural construct, and so it is an absolute. And so powers, authorities, and forms of knowledge normally considered secular still impinge on Christianity, just as much as Christianity still shapes the secular sphere. The meeting of Christianity and modernity has taken on three major forms. The first one is the encounter between Christian thought and secular thought, what we consider modern science. But we're going to leave this question to the side for now. 
we're going to discuss the relationship between Christianity, religion, and scientific thought in detail another time. The second place where modernity and Christianity meet concerns politics. According to the basic suppositions of modern thought, politics is a secular affair. Even if a ruler or a politician is personally religious, Christian or not, rarely do moderns directly say that governments should be religious, even in cases where people believe that they should be. Consider, for instance, Christian morality. The teachings of Jesus and all subsequent Christian churches tell people that they ought to act in certain ways. Say, for instance, Christians assume that you should care about poor people. But even if a certain Christian political figure strongly believes that government and religion don't mix, how is she supposed to remove her Christian obligation to care for poor people from her political role, which often asks them how poor people are supposed to be treated by the government? How can Christian ethics not be practiced by Christian politicians? And even bigger than that, how can Christian citizens who vote or serve on juries, how can they leave aside the teachings of their own given form of Christianity? There are two approaches to the matter, but neither of them fall neatly into clean lines based solely upon which church one belongs to or to that given Christian's political opinions. But there are some patterns. Christians could either try to remove their religious ethics from their political actions, or they could engage their Christian ethics, but in a secular political framework. That is, by voting, lobbying, protesting, or even revolting. The most famous and widespread example of Christians trying to insert Christian ethics into politics is referred to as liberation theology. Briefly, it's the belief that a Christian is to help people who are suffering in all situations, including through political action. Liberation theology began in the Peruvian Catholic priest, Gustavo Gutierrez, who argued that if a certain government was not helping the poor and the needy, or was actively harming them, it was required of the Christian to correct the problem through political action. Although this liberation theology grew out of Latin American Catholicism, it didn't remain there. In places where poverty was a particularly serious issue, liberation theology spread quickly. It remains common in Latin America in both Catholic and evangelical populations, and it's quite widespread in Catholic communities in sub-Saharan Africa. In the United States, liberation theology is often found in African-American Protestant communities, where government-endorsed forms of racism are repelled in explicitly Christian terms. Many notable civil rights leaders, like the Episcopalian minister, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., would fall into this category. The third major intersection of modernity and Christianity concerns personal ethics, the role and rights of individuals. Questions of personal choices and bodily autonomy are the big concerns. It's all about who and what is an individual and what individuality means. Abortion, whether or not a fetus, is an individual distinct from its mother. The death penalty, whether or not a government can end an individual human life. Feminism, whether women's individuality is equal to men's, and if equality means that men and women are to be treated identically. And lesbian, gay, transgendered, and bisexual liberation, what kinds of individual sexual and gender identities and behaviors are to be affirmed or denied. All of these, on paper, fall into the secular world of the individual. And yet, Christianity in all of its forms has a lot to say about these issues. And in each of these cases, people have argued for personal ethics over these matters from Christian angles. And again, it isn't easy to plot a clear and obvious pattern one way or another. There are people who claim to be opposed to abortion because of their Christianity. And there are others who claim to be pro-choice because of their Christianity. 
There are Christians who believe that a woman is to be subject to her husband or father. And there are also feminist Catholic nuns and Protestant women bishops. There are strong Christian arguments against LGBT rights, and there are strong Christian arguments for LGBT equality. But however these Christians feel about these issues, the problem remains. Is there an obvious, demonstrable difference between the secular and the religious, between ancient Christianity and Western modernity? Questions for class discussion. How did the Catholic Church respond to the Reformation in modernity? What was the role of church councils in this response? What are some of the unique ways Protestantism developed in the United States? What are a few issues where Christianity and modernity overlap? What are some political and ethical examples of these issues?